Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. On January the 19th in 2017, we shared a document on our uh, Facebook page and uh, it was regarding a uh, release uh, from the CIA put into its public searchable database that we had a look through. And <clears throat> this is the actual uh, unclassified document. And uh, what I've done in this Steemit blog is I've transcribed it so it's easy for you to uh, uh, copy and paste and look at. Uh, but essentially it's from the 16th of June 1992. And it's with regard to a uh, headline in the Moscow Rubachaya Tribuna. Um, and uh, it's uh, written by an author, Vladimir Lagovsky. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, well, at the time in in um, January last year, um, it's 2018 now, late. Uh, it wasn't immediately obvious uh, what was being discussed in uh, this work. But uh, in the intervening uh, sort of best part of two years, and the experiments that we've witnessed and the ash that we've analysed and actually haven't gone to Moscow and, and, and India and so forth, um, it uh, looks like uh, this document is really um, talking about a technology similar, uh, if not to the same, to cold fusion. And uh, it also seems that the technology as described in this document uh, would have enabled uh, uh, the development of the super weapons that were announced by uh, Vladimir Putin on the 1st of March 2018, such as these uh, unlimited range indomitable hypersonic missiles. And uh, essentially what it looks like is that the Russians didn't fall asleep at the wheel uh, over the uh, intervening 25 years from when this uh, article was discussed. So I'm going to go through it. Um, uh, this is, as I say, the uh, transcribed version. So uh, he essentially talks about uh, the, the, the military industrial complexes uh, uh, have been seeking so-called flying saucers and uh, uh, that uh, he the the interviewer the uh, journalist is actually looking at a document which is describing some test results for uh, a new kind of flying method and it's using uh, high tension temperature superconductors and it's saying the effect of moving a bulk uh, a bulk high temperature superconductor under the effect of a fast electron flux and so on um, anyway he, uh, the interviewee. Um, uh, well, the, the interviewer here is saying that I'm, I'm just quoting these data detail. Sorry, this data in such detail, not without reason, because stereotypes are uh, still deeply embedded here. Many still think that if you have sources, then you have aliens, and if you have aliens, then it's garbage. Uh, but basically, he's going on to say that this is actually a very serious affair, um, and the protocol of which uh, is described, uh, he, there's not a sole witness here. And there are patent, patents and uh, uh, author certificates and so forth. Anyway, uh, we are offering, says the senior fellow of the Scientific Production Association of Experimental Machine Building, candidate of technical services, Vasily Shabitnik, a principally new method of moving in space and we can demonstrate it. This is in mid-1992. So he goes on... Uh, uh, and talks about the development of superconductors and um, and then talks about ascending in the geomagnetic uh, magnetic field of the planet. Uh, and then there's a question about how do you do this in space? Uh, there's a special problem with magnetic fields there, he says, <laughs> i.e. there isn't a lot. Uh, and he says, ordinarily, that the, the vehicle must be equipped with additional, additional sustainer engines. Uh, and that, again, causes a problem because you've got to then power them. Uh, and uh, what they came up with, as they say here in paragraph 9, is uh, a, a real solution, which is a simple one, as it should be. And they have an experimental unit, uh, and they have a fast electron flux. It emerges from an accelerator and speeds past uh, the superconductor model. Uh, so this uh, model, it, uh, the, they're calling the Mohabbid's tomb, instantly jumps to the side. Uh, even the eye cannot catch its swift motion. So uh, it looks like that they're demonstrating this uh, in the lab to the reviewer. 
then there's a description of uh you know how it work would work in uh uh it says uh, now uh imagine a real space vehicle shibitnik says its airframe is covered with high temperature uh critical temperature superconductor uh, fast electron emitters are installed circularly circularly around it the charged particles will be streamlining around the vehicle and by moving will create both a current and an electromagnetic field so the field and the current will be simultaneously induced in the superconducting layer what will happen the fields and the current will begin to interact with ampere's force simply speaking the carriers will be repelled from each other and this is undoubtedly more efficient than the interaction of simple electromagnetic field of the vehicle with the Earth's geomagnetic field. The vehicle will soar as if floating in the electron medium which it itself created around itself. And then he goes on to say that the sphere is a great shape for interstellar travel, but the best thing in uh, atmosphere is a saucer. So it's uh, suggesting that you might need something that changes its geometry. But he says here... Um, a, about 100 amps will be sufficient for a five-ton vehicle. It would also be uh, easy to maneuver it by increasing or decreasing the current along its sides. And so on. So they're suggesting an electromagnetic means of, uh, of conveyance. Then he says that the best uh, 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 high-temperature superconductor that they created was minus 180 degrees C, which is fine in space. But uh, that they're using their theory, they they uh, um, have uh, supposedly, uh, or or in theory, can create one at eight hundred and fifty degrees C. Um, and uh, he goes on to clarify that they're exploring that at that time in nineteen ninety two. But he says it's quite quite real. Um, so then he says uh, Shebetnik and his colleagues are certain that they have discovered a new fundamental pattern or patterns in the structure of matter this knowledge enables them to explain the properties of matter differently from the way it has been done thus far on the basis of statistical and probabilistic concepts they suggest a more natural approach sounds good to me anyway um so basically on this basis they uh, predict and they expect to be able to in 1992 develop this 850 degree uh, superconductor <clears throat> and then he says I won't go into all the secrets uh, but he says that the uh, new superconductor can be based on plain iron the trick is uh, in the energy order of the remaining element position hmm okay now and then they're saying, well, you know, what are you going to use for fuel in space? And uh, and then he says, he, the, the interviewer, the journalist says, well, you're going to be putting a new, nuclear fusion reactor on there. So uh, there are some that have predicted that these new weapons uh, actually have a fusion reactor on there or a, a nuclear reactor of some type, uh, more conventionally understood type. Uh, or we will be getting energy from the vacuum. And then this is where it's really interesting for you guys out there. Essentially, they imply that it is the same process as in cold fusion. He says neither of the three. So I guess the, the third one would be a perpetual motion machine. So he says, uh, uh, Vasily uh, Dmitrievich responds. Do you recall another sensation which was trumpeted roughly at the same time as high temperature su superconductivity? It was reported that a so-called that the so-called cold fusion was discovered in the United States. Then this phenomena, where phenomenon was replicated in many laboratories throughout the world, that it was replicated yet again could not be explained. And why? Simply because they were trying to find the features of fusion reactors where they couldn't be found. So he's essentially saying that you know. They believed it wasn't real because they were trying to find the effects of normal fusion. Uh, and so the implication is that that, that isn't the case. Uh, and then uh, 25 is saying, I rem uh, the, this is the interviewer, and he's talking about the fact that he actually saw one. And then he, the, the interviewee, he says that they claim it is an energy conversion by transitioning the matter into a new phase and the COP, that's the coefficient of performance, is up to 4.2 times. And this is in mid-1992. It says, we call this phenomenon uh, that uh, was <laughs> discovered also in, in a, 
a, a lesser form, obviously, that was on a COP of four times on a continuous basis in cold fusion experiments, but they're suggesting it is the same phenomenon. Uh, we call this phenomenon energy conversion. And the jar itself, the cold fusion jar, is a primitive converter model. Water boils in it. Uh, using the scientific language, we are dealing with a phase transition. Yet, in this case, the water particles are moving in an orderly fashion due to electric field. And in such cases, according to our theory, phase transitions result uh, in an increase in energy release. Uh, okay, so I, I'm a little bit uh, not so clear on the wording there. Maybe it's a, a translation issue. But anyway, the gain is sum 2.2, which is just a little bit above the maximum we think we may have ever achieved in in our uh, glow stick replications, uh, up to 4.2 times, which is, uh, I think, uh, in uh, Alexander Parkhamov's 225-day test, I think it peaked out about 3.6, 3.7 times. So it's well within this range, times greater than the works spent. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, Alexander Parkhamov's 225-day uh, reactor uh, was not shielded or in, in designed in such a way to make the best use of uh, the active agent, strange radiation, etc. Um, anyway, so uh, he says, wait a second, wait a second, I'm trying to interrupt whatever, are you talking about perpetual motion? So, uh, no, we are talking about extracting the inner energy of matter, okay? And says, can it be used anyway? Yes, yeah, I can use it to boil water, but that's a terrible idea. <laughs> um, and, and so they extract energy from metal and directly generate electricity, which enables them to close the loop, yielding effectively a COP approaching infinity until all of the fuel is in a new phase. So, yeah, so he's basically saying uh, they've been able to create an electrical kind of version of it rather than just boiling water. Uh, uh, and so the, when the energy conversion occurs and uh, you can actually use metal, metal rather than solutions or, or, or liquids or whatever. Uh, uh, and then he's saying, like, uh, plug it into an electric generator, uh, uh, an output, you produce uh, four times as much energy, uh, put in uh, uh, one quarter of that, and effectively you've got a closed loop system uh, that gives you some extra energy out. So he's saying that the means to convert, uh, this is my summary of what said, um, where, where he's saying this down here, uh, I'm just summarizing it here, because the means to convert the metal to this new phase releasing energy uh, includes an electron accelerator, which also enables propulsion. Um, and this is kind of exactly the kind of thing that uh, uh, Kenneth Shoulders was saying, and that was also claimed by Chinetsky in the 1970s. And Chinetsky was visited in early 90s by um, uh, Hal Puthoff. So Kenneth Shoulders uh, said that if you get these... Uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects and you um, accelerate them, um, or firstly you, you create them, then you put some ions in there. The ions are shielded for their mass and inertia, so then you've effectively got something that just acts as an electron, and then just with a few hundred volts you can uh, accelerate it like in a cathode ray tube to uh, high percentages of the speed of light. And then when it impacts the other end, the the um, entrained ions, uh, uh, the, the the actual <laughs> confinement that is able to shield their mass and inertia, the, uh, it breaks down. The entrained ions are still travelling at the speed that they gained whilst their mass and inertia were shielded, but now they have their mass and inertia back, and so you get an impulse, and you get an impulse, and you get an impulse, and he's saying that you know. Uh, you can use something for terrestrial needs, but the electron accelerator connected into the circuit turns the converter into a space propulsor. Using it, one can reach the Alpha Centauri uh, and return back to Earth in 12 years. Wow. So he's saying that, that, that this pulsing and pulsing, of course, you're not losing uh, any of the uh, um, uh, speed that you have uh, when you're in space, uh, there's no, no sort of air friction there. So every time you hit a pulse, you're, you're gaining that uh, um, velocity. And if you can accelerate things, small things, uh, to very high speed. So he's almost describing the same kind of impulse engine that, that Chinetsky and Shoulders had observed in the same kind of uh, electrical discharge uh, we, and, and both Kenneth Scholes and Chinetsky saw gains, uh, certainly Chinetsky, I think it was uh, five, six, seven, nine, something like that, well within the range that he's claiming is possible here. Uh, and 
uh, when, when Hal Putoff uh, went to visit him. So uh, this really does sound like it's exactly the same technology, the same technology uh, that was uh, uh, talked about by David Ureth, um, uh that is able, that they had proven over 11 years to remediate nuclear waste. It's the same thing it would appear that they're talking about that enables this uh, uh, matter phase change and so releasing energy. And so he's saying, have you been able to replicate these processes experimentally? And he says, yes, otherwise I wouldn't be telling you anything. And he then says, in our estimates, the energy concealed in one kilogram of iron is quite sufficient for an interstellar journey. Wow. Wow, 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 wow in mid-1992. So it is no surprise to me whatsoever that you could have a, a, a vehicle who's maybe got some, uh, this propulsion technology on it, uh, enabling it to go at extremely fast speeds, both torpedoes underwater and, and, and uh, uh, missiles at, at unbelievable speeds, uh, indefinitely i mean completely indefinitely because i mean if you can travel for an interstellar journey on one kilogram of iron you basically have uh, no limit on earth i mean you can basically go round and round and round and round, and round for all intents and purposes it's got infinite range so you know and this is over 25 years ago well the outlook is shall we say quite fantastic this is the summary uh, of the reporter, even without flying to other worlds, after all, the energy converters will be quite suitable for earthly needs. It's about time to start dreaming not only about miracle generators capable of replacing nightmarish nuclear and fossil fuel plants, but also about new means of conveyance. All our lives could be changed dramatically. And uh, at this point, I'd just like you to consider the John Hutchison effect, where he took this uh, two by two by seven inch uh, rectangular iron billet. And uh, you can see in the video that it essentially just kind of like it loses its volume and twists and uh, it does not appear to be turning to liquid or gas and uh, the, there's a bit of skin flaking going on but the most striking observation to me is that it appears to be changing its volume uh, it is becoming possibly more dense or is some of the matter being like is it a new phase of matter or is it transmuting or is is matter being removed and moved to somewhere else i don't know uh, but uh, uh, this is a, a very, very interesting document. The fact that they say, look, essentially, you know, when cold fusion came about, it was like, OK, that's just a version of what we're already doing. Um, and that they were so far ahead. And it's interesting that Eugene Malov uh, in 1991 said that the Russians, you know, were ahead on this. And it was just a shame that the scientific community in America had basically dropped the ball on this and and, and, and made it, and also in the UK. Uh, maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they continued working on it in uh, different areas. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I think this is a very, very uh, important document to share uh, again. Uh, now that we have uh, an understanding that actually, really, we may be tapping into a new phase of matter uh, and that uh, very small amounts of material going into this phase can release very, very large amounts of energy. And if it can uh, uh, be driven purely electrically and release electrons, of which you only need to capture a, a small proportion of them to drive the process, you effectively can close the loop and as I was saying, they're claiming it's got some kind of impulse engine, which uh, is part of the energy generating process, which looks like Chinetsky, which looks like shoulders. And so I think we have some coherence uh, going on uh, with this technology.